The idea is that um, even dictators uh, need a social contract to stay in power, and uh, you know they, they can't really stay in power just by being repressive. It's very costly, it leads to all these other problems, so they create a social contract with their population. This is At Brookings, a weekly in-depth look at issues behind the news. This week, the authoritarian bargain and the Middle East. One after another, countries in the Middle East and North Africa are igniting amid demonstrations for more rights, new leadership, and new democratic governments. As the world watches these unfolding events, it's also witnessing the collapse of the authoritarian bargain, where autocratic regimes substitute generous government handouts for democratic ideals. Non-resident senior fellow Raj Desai examines the dynamics and dangers of that bargain. The idea is that uh, there's a give and take. The citizens give up the right to vote, the right to participate in political life, and in exchange they get uh, a set of economic benefits. Public sector employment, job guarantees, perhaps uh, welfare benefits, uh, and subsidies, food subsidies, medical subsidies, housing subsidies, things like that. And uh, that's, the, that's the authoritarian bargain, you know, giving up the, the chance to, to uh, to be democratic in exchange for, uh, for economic security. And this is what we see uh, falling apart in some parts of the Middle East. You say that there were two shocks that took place over the last 20 years or so that are uh, really laid the foundation for what we're seeing in the Middle East and North Africa today. So in the 1980s, of course, oil prices began to drop. Uh, now, not just the oil exporters, obviously, but the non-oil exporters were also quite dependent on, um, on oil revenues because oil revenues meant that there were job opportunities in oil-rich countries. So you had a lot of citizens from the non-oil exporting Arab countries, for example, working in oil exporting countries in the, in the oil fields. Uh, so the collapsing oil prices, the falling oil prices in the 1990s, meant that in particular the non-oil exporters had to reduce their public, um, public expenditures. And that meant reducing job guarantees, shrinking subsidies, getting rid of some of the economic benefits that the populations had grown accustomed to. Well, a big part of this, the, this whole thing seems to be youth, youth unemployment. How does it factor into the whole revolution, the authoritarian bargain? There is an entire generation of youth in the Middle East that have not found jobs, after even those who have uh, finished college. They have delayed uh, getting married. They have delayed purchasing houses, uh, other assets. All of these things have had follow-on costs for the, uh, the economies of the Middle East. Uh, you've not had the kind of job creation, and therefore you've had a lot of frustration building among, um, among the youth, which is why we see that um, a lot of these protest movements have been actually led, uh, led by youth who have really uh, grown fed up with, um, with, these, with these governments. So is it a case of if you don't have taxation, you don't expect representation? One of the things that, for example, uh, the research seems to point out as being an impediment to democracy is having natural resource wealth. Oil wealth is the, the curse of, of natural resources. Oil wealth means that uh, you have an easier time raising revenue. If you have an easier time raising revenue, you really don't need to uh, impose taxes on the population. Uh, in the United States, of course, we know that no taxation without representation, but of course, if you have no taxation, you don't demand representation. Well, with the burgeoning of the youth population and the fluctuation, the great fluctuation in oil revenues, the time must have been ripe for reform. Why was there no incentive to reform? The incentives to reform were there in the 80s, but when uh, and they were there because they had no choice when they were losing revenue. But when revenue started flowing again, uh, when oil prices started climbing, and where oil prices have been for the last several years, uh, there simply hasn't been this incentive. Uh, there hasn't been this need to diversify. You have some of the smaller economies taking steps to diversify now. For example, Qatar is, has been taking some steps to diversify uh, to, to create, uh, for example, uh, uh, areas uh, 
in economic sectors that focus on, on technology and uh, innovation. But this has been pretty rare in this part of the world. Is this the end of the whole concept of the authoritarian bargain? Whether we are going to see a wave of uh, democratizations as we saw in Eastern Europe, beginning with the, um, the opening of the Berlin Wall, uh, the Velvet Revolution in Prague, uh, revolutions in, uh, in Bulgaria, reforms in uh, Poland and Hungary continuing, uh, the collapse of Ceausescu's regime in Romania. Whether we're going to see that in, uh, in the Middle East and North Africa is, is very hard to say. Uh, as I said, I think we are seeing um, a, a, a movement spreading. Unlike the communists in Eastern Europe, um, these regimes still have resources uh, at their fingertips that they can use. They still have loyal militaries. They still have uh, extensive uh, security apparatus. Uh, and in some cases, they still have large percentages of the population that are quite, uh, quite loyal. Stay up to date with the latest research, learn about Brookings events, and search our directory of experts, all from your mobile device. To download Brookings for your BlackBerry, Android, or iPhone, Go to brookings.edu slash mobile.